I'm going to get this out of the way right away. Um, I'll be back to basics. Just have to get out of the way. It's our series. Uh, before we begin our back to basics series, The Four Rights of Spiritual Thriving, um, I want to remind you that if you want to uplift your spiritual growth this year, consider taking um, one of our classes that start this month. They're all wonderful. We received this great donation to help people take classes. So they're all at a discounted rate. That Beyond Limits class that I get to teach uh, Tuesday, starting January 16th, it's just 75 bucks. So if you're new to the philosophy or you're just wanting to ground yourself more deeply in your spiritual practice, take one of these fabulous classes with these fabulous ministers and other fabulous mile higher. So they're in person or online as well. Um, I've learned something about myself and I want to see if you resonate with it for yourself. And it's this. I am a being forever in flux, held by a changeless reality. I am a being forever in flux, held by a changeless reality. I know I'm not who I was 20 years ago. I may not even be who I was a year ago. My life is in constant motion and change. Sometimes it's really stressful and challenging, and sometimes, as wonderful as it is, I, I'm lost in it. I don't always know who I am or where I am. And yet, my whole life, and I hope you have too, I've experienced this changeless reality. On a morning walk, beholding uh, our beautiful son, who's now uh, a beautiful young man, getting to see my uh, beautiful little girl, having that moment of, of stillness and quiet, I am reminded of this changeless reality. Do you resonate at all? And so although I've never been able to quite locate myself in the flux because it's always changing, I have been so blessed to be able to find myself again and again in that changeless reality. And that's what spiritual living is all about. It's learning to have who we are informed, not just by the flux, but by this changeless reality. To know that within this changeless reality, there's an unconditional love. There is limitless wisdom. There is an unlimited knowingness. There is an unconditioned joy. Spiritual living is when we allow that part of our lives which is always in flux to be regularly informed by this changeless reality. That's what we believe in in this teaching. That we are human beings forever in flux yet held by this changeless reality. We call this changeless reality God. Spirit. And every spiritual philosophy has spoken to it in some way. One way of seeing it is that they all disagree with each other. The more valuable way of seeing it, in my opinion, is they give us different aspects of what this life and what this changeless reality is. In ancient China, there's the term Tao meaning the way or the path. And it speaks to this changeless reality as something that's reflected best as a principle in nature that we too can embody and keep with in our own life. The Tao Te Ching, a book on the Tao, says, the Tao is like a well, used but never used up. It is like the eternal void, filled with infinite possibilities. Jesus, the Christ, referred to this changeless reality. He, he compared it to an unconditionally loving parent. That this changeless reality is like a parent who loves their child so much, is so proud of them, and feels blessed when they recognize that child, the beauty and the blessing of life within themselves. He says of this changeless reality in the Sermon on the Mount, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, 
and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. In this last century, the incredible scientist Carl Sagan referred to this changeless reality as cosmos. He said, The surface of the earth is the shore of the cosmic ocean. On this shore, we've learned most of what we know. Recently, we've waded a little way out, maybe ankle deep, and the water seems inviting. Some part of our being knows this is where we came from. We long to return, and we can, because the cosmos is also within us. We're made of star stuff. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. Ernest Holmes, the founder of the science of mind, the spirituality that we convey and we practice here, he would call this God, but sometimes he would say, why don't we just call it life? Let's just call it life. Capital L, life. And he would say, what is this life? It is infinite energy coupled with limitless creative imagination. I love that. Infinite energy coupled with limitless creative imagination. What a better term for God than infinite energy. Unlimited potential. Unconditional love and creativity. That's what divinity is. And then there's this wonderful, amazing thing called limitless creative imagination. And that is where we find ourselves in the divine, and the divine rejoices in, its, in our recognition of it within ourselves. And it's using this tool of the mind that we don't just have as isolated beings, but we share in. We all share in this limitless creative imagination. And if you want a better life, what do you got to do? You got to imagine it. God cannot do for you what you do not allow to take place through you. And so if we want greater health, we've got to work on that imagination. Greater connection and intimacy in relationships, we've got to work on our imagination, our possibility consciousness. And we have to open up to live in a greater degree of faith that we co-create our lives with an infinite energy, a limitless potential, that when we combine ourselves with it, we can use to do great and incredible things for our thriving. Uh, my name's Josh. By the way, if you're new here and haven't met me, it's very nice to meet you. And what I want you to know uh, about me today is how blessed I've been by this teaching. I've been in it since I was 13 years old. So take that with a grain of salt when I say every great blessing in my life is because of this teaching. I'm actually terrified of public speaking. But I do it because I've been so blessed by this teaching. And if I can help someone else be blessed by it too, I, I've lived a, a satisfactory life. Um, I started in a, at a teen program in Huntington Beach, California, when I was 13 years old. The year before, a minister by the name of Roger Teal had left that church to come to a church called Mile High Church to be the senior minister. And at that church at that time, there was a young, in her late 20s, minister by the name of uh, Michelle Medrano, who I got to meet there, who will be back with us next week, by the way. And there were, uh, I, went, I started going because the girls were cute. That was the portal in for me. I didn't care what church it was. I'll keep coming back. But there were these, these leaders of the group, Mary and Alan Feldman. And they created safe and sacred space. What is a sanctuary, right? But safe, sacred space. And there are these, these teens there that, that would share. It was the mid-90s. So it might be a, a, a teenager who was admitting their sexuality to themselves and to others for the first time. It could be someone who was sharing a, a hurt or a trauma that they had never articulated. 
It could be that a, that a teen was, was embodying a virtue or some, a, a truth that they knew to be so about themselves, but they were afraid to share before because they might be rejected. And I, I knew almost immediately that this creating of safe, sacred space, that's what I wanted to do with my life. I did it with teens for a long time. I thought that would be it. I had no idea that I'd be a minister and 20 some years later here with you. But I want you to know that my goal every Sunday here is to create safe and sacred space. Not so that you listen to me, but that you listen to yourself. That this is an opportunity when we co-create safe and sacred space together, when we create sanctuary, that we can listen to ourselves that you can listen to your life, that you can listen to that changeless reality that can inform your life. Whole, perfect, and complete spiritual reality informing my everyday life, which can sometimes be a whole, perfect, and complete mess. (laughs) But they come together. And so I'm so grateful to get to be a part of creating that sacred and safe space that we are all a part of co-creating together. Our theme for this year's Back to Basics, the four rites of spiritual thriving. Notice the rite of passage aspect, the ritual aspect. Because that's what spiritual living is. It's about graduating to greater and greater levels of understanding, self-knowing, love, meaning in our lives. That's what it's all about. It's about graduating from a poverty consciousness to what it means to live in a prosperity consciousness. It's about graduating from a resentment-based consciousness to a responsibility, co-creator consciousness. In particular today, one of the most powerful rituals there is, is moving from that self-understanding that we are broken that there's something wrong with me, to the understanding that I'm whole, that I can live in wholeness. And that takes courage to do. Parker Palmer said, that's the thing about wholeness, is once you realize you're whole, you have to live your whole life. It will haunt you if you go back. And and so I I ask you the question today, uh, what are you graduating from? Where in your life right now, what is the, the consciousness that has taught you all it needs to teach you? that you're graduating from, and what are, you, what are you graduating into? What's the new way of understanding and being the life of your thriving is calling for in order to be created? It is up to you. And I don't know about you, but I, I think I've learned everything I need to learn from fear. I've learned everything I need to learn from resentment. I've learned everything I need to learn from blame. I've learned everything I need to learn from hatred. I've learned everything I need to learn from self-rejection. How about you? I want to learn from love. I want to learn from joy. I do not need to learn from being a broken human being anymore. I want to learn from my wholeness. And that's not just woo-woo thinking. That's courageous living, to live like a whole human being who knows there may be a lot of things wrong going on in your life, but there's nothing wrong with you. You are a precious expression of limitless creative imagination and that infinite energy that a spirit is in you and it is calling to you to admit it and to live in greater alignment with what it is. A lot of us, I'll just say in our country, I'm sure it's true in the world too, uh, we, the, the school that we go to in life, we, we call it the school of, of hard knocks. That's where the majority of people's consciousness is. Ever, anyone here ever been to the school of hard knocks? Yeah, I've experienced that. But there's a whole belief system. It's like a religion that people believe in. And, and here are the, the beliefs that go along with it. The school of hard knocks. Life is unfair. Life has zero concern for me as an individual. I am not a unique snowflake. I am broken. There is something wrong with me that will never be fixed. There is not enough. Life is about survival of the fittest. 
Happiness, love, joy, and especially spirituality are all coping mechanisms against the fact that life sucks and we're all suckers. (laughs) I'm not saying there's not validity to this school, that there's not a point of view to be argued for. I am here to say that you're better than that, that you're bigger than this, that we all are. And I I go back to the school of hard knocks from time to time. So I'm just asking us to remember there's a greater way, and it could be encapsulated in what I'm going to call uh, this morning soul university. It's time to graduate from the school of hard knocks and to start being students of soul university. And there's a whole different belief system that challenges us to step into it. And it goes like this. Soul university, life is a blessing. I am so blessed. And in that, the blessing is I get to be a blessing to others. Life not only knows who I am, but it seeks to remind me. Life is not an absent, isolated presence. It's the very truth of who you are. It's the most intimate relationship you will ever have. I am whole. I am a perfect child of God. It's sweet, but you you see how hard that is to embrace that about ourselves? Spirituality is the key to living a whole and meaningful life. Spirituality. Life is a miracle, and I am a part of it. I'm not asking you to accept it, but just be open to the idea that you are a miracle. That your very existence here on this gas ball called Earth, (laughs) hurling through space, is a miracle. And all we need to do to experience the miracle of life and of our own being is to open up our imagination to the possibility that it's true and to do our best to live like it, to act like it. It's not until we get out of the school of hard knocks and into Seoul University that we begin to see the synchronicities and the magic of our lives. Again, Seoul University is not the school of naivete, superficial positive thinking, or looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. It's courageous living. Martin Luther King Jr. went to Seoul University. Mahatma Gandhi went to Seoul University. Mother Teresa went to Seoul University. Howard Thurman went to Seoul University. Mr. Rogers went to Seoul University. It takes courage. But it's not until we're there that we begin to see how this changeless reality has shown up in our lives to help us realize our divine potential. It's a simple miracle, but perhaps the greatest miracle of my life that set me on my life path. You know, when I was going to that church, when I was 13, 14 years old, I lived in Cypress, California, which was about 20 miles away from Huntington Beach. And Mary and Alan, the second parents that I mentioned, it just so happened that they lived three minutes away from me. And I was 13, I could take a three hour bus ride, but they picked me up every Wednesday, every Sunday. What a synchronistic miracle. Mary, hi Mary, who's watching online, Alan has passed away. He's watching me too, though. Um, She just happened to work for the church. And so she saw, Josh probably wants to learn some of this stuff. It is more about just the the girls. Uh, And uh, she said, Josh is going to make the coffee, set up the chairs, and you're going to let him take the class. And all I've been doing the last 30 years is making the coffee. (laughs) setting up the chairs, and engaging in this stuff. What a blessing they were in my life. Thank you for all those rides. And I know that you have so many of these synchronistic blessings when we move out of the apathy of the school of hard knocks, the coping against the hurts. Life is still going to be filled with hurts. It's going to be filled with sorrows because we live full blast. And living a full life means it's hard sometimes. However, We can learn not from fear, but from love. Not from resentment, but from responsibility. Not from self-rejection, but self-acceptance of who we are in the holy and in the divine. My favorite book that I read last year, and I read a lot, my favorite book of 2023 was by Bono. The lead singer of U2 wrote an incredible memoir. Yeah, Tom did great uh, Bono earlier, uh, called Surrender. 
called Surrender. And he, he's pro- perhaps the most popular um, rock singer of all time and kind of a diplomat. In particular, he worked with the George W. Bush administration, transforming how um, the suffering around AIDS that was taking place in, in Africa. It's been a transformative figure. And yet, he was hit by the School of Hard Knocks at a very early age. When he was 14 years old, his mother died. She was at her own father's funeral, fainted, and never came back to life. What a hole to be created. This young Irish boy boy growing up in the midst of the troubles, not a huge future in front of him, besides perhaps being a factory worker. And when we're hit by that school of hard knocks, when life puts a hole in our lives, it's so easy to live broken, to play out that brokenness in our relationships, to leave a gaping hole that will never be filled the rest of our lives, to submit and surrender to a life of sadness and isolation. And yet, when each of us is touched by that school of hard knocks experience, it can also awaken the university of soul within us. It can awaken our spirit. And that's what happened for this young boy. This hole gave him the courage to express his creativity, to get up in front of God and everybody and sing. And it also caused him to strengthen his faith, his incredible faith that has guided him in his entire journey in a culture which says faith isn't cool, by the way. He held strongly to it. Bono says, I cannot change the world, but I can change the world inside of me. This is the work of the spiritual practitioner. We don't deny that there are difficulties or heartbreaking losses that are happening all around us if we keep our eyes open. But it is our work to know what life can be and what it really is in our hearts so that we can bring it forward. Bono has an intimate conversation with his father, who this is later in life, who has received a terminal cancer diagnosis. And he shares with his son that he has no faith I lost my faith years ago, probably when he lost Bono's mom. But I love your faith. Never let go of your faith. It is the most interesting thing about you. And that's my challenge to you this year, is to make your faith the most interesting thing about you and how you show up and how you experiment, and how you stretch, and how you're willing to envision a grander reality taking place, not just overall, but in your daily life. Bono says that if his faith ever becomes a crutch, the first thing he wants to do is to throw it away. He shares, what the human spirit longs for may not be corralled by any sect or denomination contained by a building. It's more likely a daily discipline a daily surrender and rebirth. It's more likely that church is not a place, but a practice, and the practice becomes the place. There is no promised land, only the promised journey, the pilgrimage. We search through the noise for the signal, and we learn to ask better questions of ourselves and each other. I call the signal God and search my life for clues that betray the location of eternal presence. God is present in love expressed as action. Love expressed as action. To close today, I just want to share with you three important points that I think are truly unique about religious science and science of mind, what we teach here. And each of these points is reflected in what we call here at Mile High our ongoing initiatives, things that we want to step into um, that are relevant to the world and our life every year. The first is this. The world is fundamentally good and sacred. We do not come into this life and world, but are a divine expression of life and the world. This is something we only share with our indigenous brothers and sisters, this idea that this thing called earth is sacred. We were not brought into this earth as some sort of obstacle course. We were brought forth by the earth. 
by the sacred in the earth because each of us has something, a vitamin C for this planet that it needs. Thus, we are here to take care of this earth, to nurture it, and to nurture the humanity which is a part of it. This is reflected in our wonderful Sacred Earth Initiative led by Dr. Patty and Dr. Barry. And I love this idea that we are not separate from earth, but we are its children, and we are here to care for it, including ourselves. Second, although brought up in a collective consciousness of separateness and violence, we are not born of sin or of separation, but we are born whole and complete. It sounds simple to so many of us, but it's unfortunately not the teaching of so many of the faiths that we love and value. We believe wholeheartedly here, not that you don't have room for improvement, but that you are born a beautiful, precious expression of the divine, physically and spiritually. And we are here to embody that truth and to live it more abundantly. Do we make mistakes? Do we sin? Do we self-reject? Yes, atone, get saved, get better, whatever that looks like for you, but know that you are a perfect, beautiful expression of the divine. This is expressed beautifully in our diversity and belonging initiative here, which isn't about wokeness, it's about oneness. It's about honoring the dignity and the spiritual rights of all people, no matter what faith they are, political affiliation, gender identification, whatever it may be. We love everybody and we uphold their dignity. This is important to remember in 2024 because it's going to be an interesting year, isn't it? <laughs> you know, it, it is the American way to demonize politicians. I'm not asking us to get out of that, but it is not the American way to demonize people who vote for those politicians. And it's <laughs> up to us in what will be a certainly strenuous times and have your feelings political, stand in your truth, speak it powerfully, but uphold the dignity of your fellow citizens. Listen to them. Try to understand them. Convince them with argument if they're listening, but don't release that dignity that is such a part of not only our spiritual way, but the true American way as well. Lastly, we are here not just to learn, but to thrive Heaven is a consciousness. We as humanity are called not to hope for in the afterlife, but to create in this life. This is expressed in our beautiful interfaith initiative led by Reverend Zamira, where we realize that we do not discriminate against wisdom. We find in all the great faiths and all great philosophies tools for living and tools for not waiting for eternity to happen in the afterlife, but to weave it into this life the spiritual life, to make sure that that reality, that unchanging reality is something that's visible in how we treat one another and how we live and how we show up. And I believe wholeheartedly if you embrace these three ideas for your life, that your life will be more abundant, it will be more meaningful, and you will be much more who you are and who you are meant to be. So closing in prayer, I just invite any of our incredible prayer practitioners to stand and join us. And before we close our eyes, take a look at these incredible people because part of their spiritual path is making a commitment to support us in our spiritual journey. And every Sunday after church here in the sanctuary, they, they are in front of the stage. And I invite you to utilize them regularly, not like a hospital where you're sick and asking for help, but to help they, they are here to affirm the life that you are co-creating with spirit. You don't even have to have a request. You can say, just pray for my well-being. Pray for the highest good. Give yourself that gift because these practitioners have committed their spiritual lives to this. And guess what? We get blessed by getting to pray for you as much as you get the blessings from the prayer. So knowing that, I invite us again back into that question. What am I called to graduate from this year and into? Knowing that that greater degree of livingness is calling to each of us that in this flux of everyday human living filled with change often struggles and tribulations there's still this changeless reality and it contains within it not nothingness but the breath of limitless creative imagination and as we allow that limitless creative imagination to touch our hearts I know it works through us 
helping us to move from sickness to healing, from impoverishment to richness, from brokenness to wholeness, from self-rejection to self-acceptance of who we are in spirit. I know that this activity not only blesses our own lives, but it blesses those whom we love and care for. It blesses everyone who we come into contact with. Honoring the spirit and this healing, knowing that it is in every one of us. We see it, we celebrate it, we are it, and we practice it every day because that's who we are. And so it is.